I've been working all day doing stuff for the New York Roadrunners. You can tell because of my outfit. And I really apologize. I got my days confused and I thought it was Wednesday. And ugh. anyway, my, my sincere apologies. You guys, thanks for sticking together for a half hour and letting me be late. No, thank, thank you. Um, yeah, we, uh, one of the questions uh, my assistant Jeff had asked the rest of the team is, are you guys having um, a tough time keeping your days straight? So uh, perfect, <laughs> perfect segue. Yeah, the answer is yes. The answer <laughs> is yes. <laughs> Oh, and and you uh, you got a puppy as well. My my assistant will probably have his dog flash up. <laughs> uh, yeah, we want we to just let everyone get a chance to see Truman. In fact, I was bringing him in from. We got a ton of snow, and I was bringing him in from going out to try to go to the bathroom. And my husband says, "Jenny, I think you're getting emails. I think you're supposed to be somewhere right now." <laughs> so well, thank thank you so much. Um, you know, I. Uh, I'm glad we have the opportunity to talk and, um, you know, thanks, thanks for joining us. So, um, I've sent the uh, part, part of my goal here is just getting our athletes connected with people in their sport, um, you know, that they might recognize on, on TV and, but still kind of share, um, some of the same, uh, same things, you know, you, you had a college experience, um, you had goals in college, you had teammates in college and, and, um, just kind of see how there's a lot more similarities than than we might think. So, um, can you share a little bit? Yeah, about, yeah. Share a little bit about your college experience and and what you know. You went to CU and it was it's quite the tradition there. And so, just tell us a little bit about your experience at CU. Yeah, so joining CU is a. I mean, it's a big deal. I, sp I mean, I felt like when I joined. Dathan had just um, gone pro and uh, of course there was kind of the legend of the Gauchers and there was this really big history kind of preceding me and to think that by any um, by any measurement I would be um, kind of welcome onto a team like that was really exciting um, but I think that whether there's all that history and lore and um, you know all those big names that precede you once you get onto a college team it's really about um, seven, eight, nine women trying to score the best they can that first fall. And so um, it really was probably a more similar experience um, and, and less like living the Running with the Buffaloes book than people think. <laughs> and so, uh, and that's what makes college really great is that you're just this collection of people that come in from all over the country often and, and sometimes, you know, kind of more regionally. Um, but you have different backgrounds, you have different upbringings and you're all kind of coming together and figuring out how to live on your own for the first time together. Um, and so I really loved my freshman year because I feel like it was a lot of us just figuring it out together. Um, then from my freshman year, obviously, um, I had a really fun and exciting and storied career at CU after that. Uh, and so my relationship with my coaches uh, became really special. My relationship with the team evolved and changed. But um, again, it's just really about being on a team. And uh, I loved racing for my school and I loved being on the team and having those relationships to the extent that um, I came back, you know, even after my fourth year, I came back for another semester to finish up cross country. So um, I loved college. I thought college was really, really fun. You've got you've got dogs. I've got a kid, so he, he just woke up from his nap and was was screaming for dad. So, um, what uh, in college? What were you know? You had a lot of records and and a lot that a lot that still stand. And um, you know, you also had a couple big frustrating moments. Um, you know, cross country was notable in that. Can you just kind of share a couple of your your highs and lows and what they've meant to you? Um, beyond now yeah so yeah you're never gonna leave you know when you when you work so hard at something and you put your whole heart and soul into something I don't think you're ever gonna leave without having experienced some lows <laughs> so sometimes it's as simple as just knowing in those moments um that you know the the it's just helpful knowing in those low moments, like they're going to be there for everyone. It's not unique to you or to this journey. Um, every single time you try really hard, 
Um, you're, you're going to experience some amount of failure. And I feel really lucky because my parents are not, um, I don't come from a background of sports. They're not necessarily athletes and I didn't watch a lot of sports growing up. Um, and so I didn't have this fantasy idea of what a sports career would look like. And so as I went through things that were easy and hard, my parents kind of had this reaction of like, well, that's just life. That's just how life goes. Um, and so there's that. But then um, let's see, one, some of the toughest stuff. Um, I mean, I think a lot of people forget that all through college, I raced Sally Kipiego. So I was second for a lot, a lot of years before I ever got to win anything. <laughs> she was in, she ran for Texas Tech. Um, she just made the Olympic team in the marathon. Um, but she and I were in college together and she um, was in my conference, in my region well. <laughs> and at nationals. Um, and so I experienced second place a lot in college, a lot more than I think people now realize. Um, so chasing her and knowing that she was basically unbeatable for two years of my career, I'm really, you know, clawing up to her level and working hard every day, knowing um, it was going to take years to, to get there. Um, that was kind of a long-term uh, battle for me, kind of believing that eventually maybe someday I can close this 30-second gap between me and her in a cross-country race. Um, and then there were the really acute disappointments like cross country. I came back, I did an extra semester of school. I wanted to exhaust my cross country eligibility. I'd been second at cross country nationals two times in a row. And I really could have, I, I really should have been able to win it my senior year. And I just really let the pressure get to me. And I finished 163rd, I think, something like that, 164th. Um, and it was just a, that was a really terrible experience. Um, and you learn a lot, you learn a lot through that. You learn a lot, uh, about the fact that the sun will rise the next day and life isn't over. <laughs> um, you learn that, um, your, you know, closest relationships are the ones that can really kind of help pull you through a lot of that disappointment. Um, and I think then moving on to the other parts of my career, I'm really grateful that I had some of those experiences throughout my career because then standing on the world stage you know when you're really afraid like what if something really goes wrong here I've worked so hard to get this far I can say I know I'll be all right because I've had I've had really tough uh I've had really tough failures before that's not going to happen today but if it did I'll get up tomorrow I'll still be a successful athlete and life will move on I think one of the you know being on the runner space side of things and getting the chance to interview you a couple of times and, and um, you know, uh, talk to you after races and then obviously seeing your interviews on TV, uh, you've always come across very genuine. And I think, you know, the, when you lost your shoe at the worlds uh, a few years ago and uh, your interview afterward, you mentioned you, you felt bad about kicking it off. You didn't want to <laughs> impede anybody else as well. Yeah. <laughs> so I, it's, it's great to see that, you know, that kind of reaction from someone who um, is at the, at the highest levels. Um, are there, you know, yeah, thanks. One, one, uh, one question that I wanted to ask, and then I'll see if, you know, any of my team has some questions for you. Um, you know, you were very, very, very dominant in the steeplechase in, in college. And it seemed, uh, I know mean, you had the collegiate record in the 5k and, um, had the success in cross country and and almost everybody shifts longer uh, you know everybody kind of shifts to that next distance up what was the reasoning for uh, staying with the 1500 I mean you got the collegiate record by the biggest margin in that event what what was with deciding to stay with that one and then now staying with it for so long what do you love about the 15? Yeah, no, you're right. I ran the steeplechase for four years in college. I was uh, fifth at the world championships in 2009, which eventually was translated into fourth. Um, and I had a lot of momentum in the steeplechase. And I think, especially nearing the end of college, I really envisioned a future that probably looks more like Emma's career than my career. You know, I thought I would be in the steeple for a really long time. Um, but uh, in 2009, it was great. We were going after all these. So 
I was in the best shape of my life. I was running really well. I had run the um, collegiate record indoors in the 5K and the 3K mile. And so um, I think we had gotten the outdoor 5K and um, the steeplechase already. And so um, we were looking for a race to hopefully be able to run fast enough to get the collegiate record in the 1500, just to kind of be able to sweep those three uh, distances again, indoors and outdoors. And so the season was kind of coming near an end. And you guys know to run a fast 15, it's really helpful to have competition uh, and to have people pulling you along. Uh, and the collegiate record at the time was by Hannah England, um, who ironically ended up being second in 2011 at the World Championships yeah. uh, when I won. But she had run 406. And so to find, I mean, at that time, to find a 406 race in college was, was really hard to do. And so um, my coach reached out to the Prefontaine Classic and asked if I could just get a spot on the start line to run the 1500 meters at that race. And that felt like it made sense because I'd run in Eugene several times and we had championships there. Um, and so I was comfortable with the track and I just was going to pretend like, you know, all these women on the start line with me weren't all professionals and I would just see how fast I could go. Uh, and of course, a lot of people know in 2009, I ran the 1500 meters at Cree and ran 359 um, and shocked myself and shocked, you know, my coaches and everyone else. And it was funny, I had done a time trial before that race and we, we really thought I could run, you know, low fours. You know, Mark was really confident I could run 403 or 402. But I definitely reached uh, beyond even what Mark was predicting. So it was a really, really special race. And that day really changed uh, the course of my career. Um, so I, I, I finished that race and then I went back to NCAAs and continued racing in the steeplechase. I ran the steeplechase of the World Championships. But then going, pro, of course, there was a lot of intrigue, a lot of interest. If I could run 359, I could probably race um, the 1500 meter on the world stage. Um, but the question is, can you recreate that magic? Can you run 359 again, you know? Um, and so I went and started working with a 1500 meter uh, specialist coach, Julie Benson, down at uh, Colorado Springs. And I made the transition to that event. And in 2011, I won Worlds. So if you run 359 and then two years later you win Worlds, you, you become that, that becomes your event. You don't get to do another event. That's what I learned. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Um, uh, on, at that world's, I, I, I love the reaction. Have, have you watched that video? I'm sure a few times, you know, what do you think about that reaction? You know, when you, you finish and you're like, oh, did I just win? Oh my gosh, I did. Okay. I'm tired. Wait, yeah. I'm really excited. You know what? <laughs> yeah, I know my reaction is so ridiculous. Uh, and it's funny. And actually we were just recently going through some old boxes cause we just moved um, and I found, you know, old pictures of that day, which are really funny. Actually, my reaction in 2011 is not dissimilar to my reaction at pre. And so those two are always going to be like, really, um, you know, my mouth is gaping open. Like, I can't believe it. Just like everyone else around me can't believe it. Um, but, uh, yeah, the, I mean, it was, it was just a really incredible experience. I if to kind of take a peek behind the curtain, Heading into the 2011 World Championships, I had run 2007, 2008, and 2009. I'd run World and Olympic Games in the steeplechase. And so you go, and the steeplechase is almost always the, well, at least at that time, it had always been one of the first events on the schedule. So I was often in the morning session on the first day. Um, you do a round, you get through hopefully to the final, and then you run the final, you know, two days later. Um, and so if the Olympic games is two weeks long or if world championships is a week long, I was done like on the second or third day. And so, um, there's just, there's just a lot of that steeple chasing experience. that was really kind of tight and short, um, compared to then you show up and I'm running the 1500 meters for the first time in 2011. And as I'm sure you guys know, when you go to the world championships, you have a round and then you have a rest day and then you have a semifinal and then you have a rest day and then you have a final. And so I remember just like I felt in pre, I remember racing the 2011 world championships and just thinking, I'm going to just 
stick with these women as long as I can. And eventually, I mean, they're so good. Eventually they're going to run away from me and I'll just see how high I can place. I'll see if I can hang on for dear life and run something respectable. I was just happy to have made the final. And so I had made my goal of making the final. I'm there. I'm just going to hang on for dear life. Um, and then, you know, we get a lap in, we get three, 800 meters and finally we're at the bell lap and I'm realizing like no one's run away yet. And so I'm just going to stick on them, stick on them. Um, and I remember coming down towards the finish and thinking, all right, I'm going to run my guts out this last 150 meters and get to the finish line. And I remember getting to the finish line and thinking, did I mess something up? Like, is there another round? Like, I, I couldn't believe that they just let me win. Like I thought surely like they're all, they're all so much better than me. And so that was truly like what was going through my mind when I crossed the finish line. I'm kind of looking around for a second, like, wait a minute, am I, do I get to celebrate because this really <laughs> happened? Or was this just a semifinal and everyone let me win because I forgot that there's four rounds and not three or something. So it was, it was that surreal of an experience to do uh, that well. And then another woman, you know, that had been racing came over and gave me a hug and she's like, Oh my gosh, you won. And that's when I thought, Oh, okay, I can celebrate. I really won. <laughs> awesome. Are there any questions from the team uh, you'd like to ask Jenny? a question um so i know that like you've had some setbacks and right now we're like our whole team's kind of just struggling with motivation since we're all like with online classes and you know things are changing pretty rapidly and we're in a weird place so like when you've struggled or if you've struggled with like motivation issues how do you like get through that and refine that motivation yeah. or passion for running you know, one of the common experiences a lot of us have had is going through an injury. Um, we all will now at the end of this have this common experience, but this is unlike anything any of us have been through before. <laughs> um, but I, I'm known at CU for telling the students when, um, when, they're, when they're going through an injury and they're cross training and they're separated from the team and all of that is really hard and your motivation is kind of in question. Um, I've been known for saying that the day is long, but the year is short. Like getting through today feels like such a slog. But when you're healthy again, it's a year from now, you're gonna look back on this and it's gonna be a blip. And you have to, in the hardest days of cross training and rehab and getting healthy, you have to remember a year from now, this you won't even remember this. Um, and so I've been kind of trying to apply that principle to this time as well and just think what are the things that I don't have to give up on and I don't have to change. Um, a good example of that was that probably the first week or two, so I'm the one who cooks in our house and probably the first week or two, um, I like everyone else just stocked up on kind of like box staple, long, non-perishable type of food um, and was I mean, I was kind of teasing my husband, we're eating like survivalist food, you know? <laughs> um, and then after a week or two of that, I just realized like, we don't have to dramatically change how we have lunch and dinner. You know, the grocery stores are still open, there's still fresh produce. Um, that part of our life kind of changed just because life felt really different and it felt kind of scary and the news was really different. Um, but if I really calmed down and look at the situation, a lot of that adjustment was really self-imposed. Um, so part of getting through my day is saying, you know, things like what, how can I, you know, shop, go to the grocery store fewer times than I used to, but how can I shop similar to how I was before, um, and buy all the fresh produce and make it ahead of time and have lunch and dinner like we would on a normal week. Um, it's been kind of hard here because I don't, I don't know about um, you guys with weather, but we've had really rough weather. We've had the snowiest spring so far. If I showed you out my window, it's like a total, total whiteout. Like we have probably over a foot of snow on the ground right now. <laughs> so being quarantined and trying to run and trying to have a normal, you know, so much of a normal life and having snow, that's been really hard for me too. Um, and I think, yeah, you, you got to just try to keep your day as normal as possible. Look at the things that you've made, these big adjustments that you just didn't have to make. Um, 
you know, I don't know how you guys' online classes are working. It seems like every school is a little bit different, but try to keep a schedule, set your alarm, wake up at the normal time, take your classes at the normal time. Um, even if you don't have to call in to your class, sit down and do the work for that class at the time that your class was scheduled. Um, and if you really are disciplined about that for a day or two, I think you'll start feeling a little bit better and a little bit like, all right, life is not unhinged. Like I can have a normal life in this. On the subject of Thank produce, uh, Etta, you want to jump in with your question? Hello. Um, I've been asking this to everyone we've been talking to, and it's been kind of a fun question. Um, <laughs> what is your favorite way to consume potatoes and why? Oh, <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> um, oh, man. Probably, I mean, this is... I'll give you a not serious answer and then a serious answer. My not serious one is like if anyone else made them. <laughs> so French fries or hash browns or anything that was made by someone else because I do a lot of the cooking. <laughs> um, but let's see, we had mashed potatoes last night. I made meatloaf and mashed potatoes because it was going to be a snowy night. Um, so we just recently had mashed potatoes and that probably would be my favorite way to have to have potatoes. Except now that I said hash browns, hash browns are really good. Maybe I need to make those. <laughs> Other questions? I got one. Uh, so next year is an Olympic year, I guess. Uh, so what are you like, how are you preparing for that at this point? And what does your training look like? Yeah, so, and this kind of ties in with the earlier question about just motivation and so forth. Um, you know, I've kind of stepped back from feeling like I'm preparing for the Olympics or I'm preparing for the US Olympic trials or I'm preparing for the Fifth Avenue Mile or whatever. Um, I've just taken a step back and said, we have no idea when we're gonna be racing again. And so my strategy has been to just dial back the intensity stick to the same mileage that I typically run and just go out and get in the miles and lay down a really good base and foundation. Um, the sad truth is that for now, we're all, you know, athletically kind of in a holding pattern, whether you're an NCAA athlete or you're an elite athlete um, or you're in high school. I, I really think nobody knows when we're going to be back competing again. And so I feel like if I'm able to kind of get the miles in and then do a lot of the auxiliary work that I, I'm, I admittedly am not always very good about, you know, the rehab stuff, the ab workouts, the stretching, you know, if I can do all of that stuff that I normally am really lazy about <laughs> and get, um, and get the miles in, um, then I'm never going to be, you know, we're really wearing my body down to the extent that I couldn't. 12 weeks out, start getting really ready for something hard. Um, but I'm also, you know, not taking this big long break. Um, so my strategy for now, and this is just the best that I know, is just to kind of be in that, um, kind of like when you finish your cross country season and you go in a little bit of that foundation training mode, or maybe for you guys, a better example is like the summer when you're done with outdoors and you're getting ready for cross country and you go into that base training phase. I'm kind of staying there in a little bit of a holding pattern for a while until until we start to see a light at the end of this tunnel um i was wondering when you have like a early run what do you eat before that run if it's like at 6 a.m or like 7. so i am a creature of habit and it's a combination of habit and discipline um it's not always regimented because I'm like a super disciplined person. It's just because I'm not very creative, <laughs> but I have the same thing before every morning run. I wake up in the morning, I have a cup of black tea with a little bit of milk and a scoop of collagen in it. Um, so that there's, I mean, just a little bit of protein. Um, I have a piece of toast with um, raspberry or grape jelly on it. And that's, that's what I have before every, um, whether it's a long run or whether it's a workout, black tea and toast just really sit in my stomach really well. It's kind of enough um, that 
I can make it through. If I, if I know I'm going to go on a long run and I feel kind of hungry in the morning, sometimes I'll add like some peanut butter and Nutella or something. Um, but that's it. I've been doing that for, sorry, my husband's coming to get Truman. He's, he's being excited, excited and needs, oh, needs another, <laughs> needs a, another form of entertainment. Um, anyway, uh, but yeah, that's been my go-to for probably over a decade now. Thank you. Yeah. You mentioned uh, Sally Kipiego a little bit earlier and definitely one of your biggest rivals in college. What, um, who's, I guess two part question, who's your, who's the toughest person to race now and who do you enjoy racing the most now? Um, the toughest person to race. Um, I mean, there's such a collection of people kind of at the, at the world level um, in the 1500 that are really tough to race. The toughest people to race are the people that are really unpredictable. Um, and I don't think a ton of people are that unpredictable. <laughs> so that's good. Um, probably the toughest people to race are, are teammates. Um, I, when Danny is in a race with me or when Emma is in a race for me, I just feel like I have so much, uh, so much like love and respect and desire to see them do well, that there are times where I have to make sure that that's not a distraction to me. Um, I think especially, you know, BU was a good example. I raced the 5k indoors and McKenna and Danny were in there. And so I know this isn't exactly what you probably mean by who's the toughest person to race. Um, because it's not that it's, it's not that I'm, you know, worried that I'm going to get out kicked or that, um, they're going to blow by me and run away from me, but it's hard for me to race with them because as I'm warming up and I'm cooling down, I really want to be that coach and that mentor to them. Um, and at some point I really have to shift over to be their competitor. Um, and so that, that's been interesting for me to navigate. Um, Emma and I raced quite a few times when, um, I was, um, well, yeah, when we were both in college and then both as pros. And I just kind of had a little bit of the same feeling of like, this is somebody that I, I lay everything out on the track with all throughout the week. And it's hard to get into a race and just put all of that aside and be competitors. Um, so I don't know how other groups do it when they have to raise people all the time. Because <laughs> I've really only had, you know, McKenna and Danny and Emma and just a few people like that. Um, and then who do I like to race the most? Um, I think I like to race, I like to race people that are really, really tough to beat and people that I race frequently. So racing Shelby is fun for me. Um, oh, yeah. cause I think it's going to be exciting. I mean, it's ex as exciting as it is for the fans. It is for us too, at least for me. Um, I know she's going to be really hard to beat. And so I like seeing how hard I can try to, you know, to get the job done. Um, I think probably one of the best back and forth type of um, racing dramas I've experienced in my career was back when I was racing the steeplechase in college and um, Anna Willard and I were racing. And the reason I think that was so fun and exciting is because it was like a true rivalry. Uh, she and I are very different personalities. We had very different racing styles, but probably, I mean, I don't know what our records are against each other, but it probably is close to 50-50. I mean, my recollection is that she won about half the time and I won about half the time. And that's, that's like so exciting to, to watch that back and forth, um, especially between two people that come from really different training backgrounds um, and have really different personalities. So if I look back and I say what was the most kind of intriguing rivalry is probably that steeplechase rivalry between about 2006 and 2009. Any other Team questions, one, team members want to jump in with questions? Can I ask you guys a few questions? Yeah, go for it. Yeah, I'm curious. Are you guys still finding ways to run with people or are you guys mostly running totally on your own? Um, well, we, we're quarantining together, so we've been able to run together. Um, but I mean, that's, that's just us. I don't but know. But before that, that before yeah. it was really hard to run. Yeah. And 
we we like we weren't even supposed to have a season so like we yeah we were, we were supposed to be um abroad this semester so oh yeah but so <laughs> we have a guy on our team that you guys probably know joe and um joe klecker and i ran his show and we were laughing about how like i said oh if, do you want the company i'll come out and i'll run your warm-up with you and he's like if i have four miles of somebody i'm running you know 90 miles this week with nobody <laughs> and so i think yeah there's there's people like joe and i that really are not running hardly any miles with people and that's a really new different shift um with all this quarantining going on What are you finding enjoyable about that? Um, you know, it's a, uh, um, it is, it is a big shift, but I guess what's, what's enjoyable about running to you right now, because there's not that competition and, and what you've, your last decade plus has been competition, 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 you know, what, um, how does yeah. this bring it back to the roots of what running means to you? So, I have done a couple of hard sessions where I've been out on the road and we call them true fartlek where you warm up some certain amount of time and then I so probably none of you were ever running before the time of GPS watches <laughs> where we all just had to know like where the mile markers were that was my college experience was there was no such thing as or at least GPS watches were just barely emerging um returning to some of that kind of mentality and saying all right i'm going to warm up from my house to a place that i know is about three miles away and then i'm going to just run hard and run easy at certain intervals um that are just determined by me in the moment and then i'm going to do two loops around this lake which i know is approximately you know four miles and then i'm going to run home and i leave my watch at home and it's really hard to do and it's been kind of weird the first week or two and then it's really liberating it's really fun to find different ways um to get a harder session in and just run completely by feel um i also did an ascent up you know a trail where i just said i'm just gonna leave my watch behind and i don't know how far it is and it doesn't really matter i mean i know roughly it's probably around eight or nine miles or something from my house to get back um and doing some of that kind of running has been, I think, the most fun and most special and just not feeling really addicted to the watch and being able to kind of put in my running log. I, I ran hard, but I'm not really sure exactly how hard and it was beautiful and I enjoyed it. And the data is all just by feel, it's not numbers. On the hard workout topic, um, what's been your hardest or most memorable workout? Um, at any any stage of your career what's what's one that kind of stuck with you we do a workout oh my gosh we do a workout in kind of the late season kind of in that hardest most intense but like you're not tapering yet sort of period whether it's cross country or outdoor track where we do four to six times a thousand at you know somewhere between 3k and 5k pace really hoping to get down to 3k pace um, with 400 meters rest and i think that's probably a pretty common and pretty staple workout but it is so hard oh my gosh it's so hard and i always get you know to number four and number five and i think there's no way i'm gonna make it to the end uh and then when you do make it to the end and the last one is your fastest one i feel like that is like the workout repeat k's that i feel like if i crush that workout i I feel so good about stepping into racing and stepping into, you know, the tapering and the sharpening and doing 200s and stuff like that. Cause I know I just have this really big aerobic base behind me. Any, any other teammate questions? Truman, here. All right. I'll, I'll end I'm with, see if Truman okay. <laughs> yeah. Bring Truman over. Um, okay, he's being he's being really naughty he's like <laughs> sitting over there looking at me like just barely out of arm's reach i'm like come on over here and he's like no i'm gonna be i'm gonna be naughty <laughs> <laughs>
So of all of all the things you've you've done, all the places you've been able to go, and and um, you know some great things that running's afforded you in your career, um, what's what's one of your biggest memories, you know, or or something that's going to stick with you the most through from from all these experiences? Um, the night that I medaled in Rio we were the last event of the night and so we did our lap around the track um and it, you know what actually correction i'm not positive i don't remember if we were the last event of the night i think maybe our final was but i'm not entirely sure um and then i know for sure we were the last event of the night when i was there in moscow um the the few times that i've had the incredible like experience of meddling at least two of those times it was late and i had to do drug testing and then stick around um and actually this was true not when i meddled but um when i was fifth in the steeplechase in 2009 and like emerge emerging from the drug testing and from the tunnel and then finally meeting back up with my husband and my coaches to like an empty dark stadium those are the best memories of my career just knowing like all of this work and and it was just a few of us that showed up every single day um you know i love my parents and i love my siblings and i love my friends but they weren't there every single day you know my coaches and my husband were there every single day through the ups and the downs they saw everything they saw the days that i was ready to quit they saw the days where i thought i was unbeatable um and to have all of that work you know, accumulate to something as special as bringing home hardware <laughs> from Worlds or Olympics and then being left in that huge stadium, totally empty and just have the three or four of us. Um, there's something really like powerful and I can just sit and talk and think about it now and get emotional thinking about it. It just feels like that's the way it should end. It should end in this big stadium with no fans, with somebody sweeping up the trash and with all of us you know, all three of us or four of us, whoever happens to be on the trip, uh, standing there just looking at each other like, yeah, this is where our, this is how far our work got us this year. Awesome. That's, that's a tremendous, tremendous memory, um, I'm sure. So, well, thank, thank you so much for your time. We really, really appreciate it. Yeah, I really apologize for being late. <laughs> thank you to Jason for like, making me make it at all <laughs> um but you guys this i know this is so crazy we don't know how long this is gonna last but you know find ways to be creative and i don't mean creative as in like you know lifting weights with cans of beans or something like find ways to be creative just in your life and in how you love people and um the type of hobbies you take up you know find ways to just explore who you are um and this time is going to fly by and we're going to look back and say what did we make of it so think about that now not in a year when we're all past it day day is uh, long but the year is short so. but the year is short that's great all right good luck you guys thanks for including me